So yeah, yeah, to tell us where, who are you and where are you in the world? I'm Nick Susanis. I'm a comics maker and professor of comics -y stuff. I'm in San Francisco, where I teach at San Francisco State and run a comic studies program here. And San Francisco has been deluged for the last three weeks with rain, which is rare for us, but it stopped and the sun has come out. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, so how did I come to comics and education? So uh, like probably many kids my age, I was into comics as a kid. It was I had an older brother who read comics to me and read comics with me. So I ended up with Batman as my first word. As in junior high, I made my own comic. I made uh, my own series called Locker Man, and he makes a, co a cameo appearance in my dissertation many years later. But when I came to undergrad, doing comics was didn't exist. And even if it did, I wanted to do intellectual things and intellectual things and comics were not on the same page. I was still into comics. I would still draw things, but I studied mathematics as an undergrad. Um, and it's prompted this interesting thing for me in recent years. When you study mathematics, people say, so what do you do when you say, oh, I, I study mathematics? They say, oh, you're so smart. And when you're known for making art, which I am now, they say, oh, you're so talented. And I I see that sort of funny dividing line. Like, I think I was a really clever and talented mathematician. I don't know how smart I was, but in making my art, my art allows me to be smarter than I could be without it. So a lot of goals in my current work and my teaching is how do I see people, have people see both sides of that and see that they're part of that. So like I said, there's this dip in my comics making from sort of college years and a little beyond that. And then I came back to it. I came back to it a, a little bit later, and and this was for a political art show around the 2004 U.S. presidential election. And I, in that work, I turned away from the sort of superheroes and funny stories that I'd made and made an essay, comic as essay, and using the, the metaphorical potential of images and the way images and text could speak to each other and saw that I could really get some complex meaning across. And so that really sparked some ideas for me. I'd always been interested in education but I had always been a little bit shy of academia. I have an undergrad and I have a master's degree in, in interdisciplinary studies and math and art, but I always was just reluctant to commit to that because it felt like a lot of the things that happen in academia stay in academia. Um, but what I saw with my comics was not only was I doing this thing that I loved to do as a kid, but that I could bring this way of working and combine it with my concerns about education and put them in together and, and create something that didn't simplify the ideas I was after, but really, really allowed me to get at them in a deeper way and bring them to a broader audience. So I opted, I looked to get my doctorate. I, I liked being in the, I was teaching as an adjunct and I really liked being part of that, but it's not a sustainable job. So I thought, oh, I'll get my doctorate. And then because I was doing this comics work, I'm like, this is what I want to do. I didn't see it as particularly groundbreaking. I, I thought the argument for comics as scholarship had been won with the existence of Mouse and understanding comics from Scott McCloud and Persepolis, Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis, but, but it hadn't been won completely. And so I ended up drawing my dissertation as a comic book, which was subsequently published as Unflattening, which which really pointed a direction towards new scholarship. And the work itself ended up, wasn't my original intent, but ended up becoming an argument for why comics as scholarship and other things, other forms of scholarship ought to be part of what we do in academia and why these things matter and why they help us be more ourselves. So, so like I said, I was a comics maker as a kid. I made them through high school. I did make them in college, but I actually did a philosophy, independent study as a comic, but I never finished it. It was an overly ambitious project with a very generous teacher. I studied mathematics, and then when I graduated, I was a tennis player, so I traveled around playing tennis, and I thought about making comics about life on the tour. And then I stopped playing, and um, I kept making comics on the side. I made my living as a tennis player, as a tennis pro, all the way through the end of doctoral school. So that was, so I had this job that I could 
you keep moving and think a lot about how people learn, but learn through their bodies. But it allowed me to do a whole bunch of other things. And I was in Detroit where I ran, I started and ran an arts magazine. So I wrote about the arts and still there's little bits of comics in my background, but I mean, my in the background, but I'm not, I'm not devoting any real time to it. And then with this invitation to this political art show, uh, I have to do it, right? I have to make something and I only have a few days. So I turned to comics and in doing that, I really saw, I just saw the sort of fusion of my interests and my sort of creative skill come together. So I, I think as an undergrad, even if comics like in a school of illustration or something had been an option, I think I would have dismissed it as that's just fun. That's for entertainment. And I want to do the intellectual stuff. And I don't think I would have made the connection to say, oh, this is intellectual stuff. It's just in a different form than we're used to. So it's really these political comics around the 2004 election that like opened things up for me. And I saw this, I saw the potential for what I could do with them. And then shortly after that, we organized an exhibition around games and art. And a buddy of mine just said, why don't you make the, the essay as a comic book? So I did this longer form comic on games and art. It's on the history of games, how games work, rules, and then it applies it to philosophy of life. And, and it's those pieces that really set things, set the tone for what I would do going forward. And then when I came to Columbia, I said, this is the kind of stuff I can do. I can make, I can wrestle with big ideas. I can put deep content in there. But it comes in a sort of way that, that that it's subversive. I think I see my comics as subversive in that they seem accessible and they are accessible, but they the depth of meaning is hidden. The way I strip out a lot of the, uh, it can be divisive language when you're talking politics, but I strip out academic language. I, I strip out jargon and replace it with metaphors. A big question I get with my work is what is it about? So when students, undergraduate classes wrestle with it, Often, everybody in the class has a different idea. Like My work is about education, I think, but I never say that. And so students have different takes. And I like that because it allows them to find their own way. In. Um, I think you still get the kernel uh, of what the meaning is about, but, but you might apply it differently depending on which walk of life you come from or when in your walk, when in your life you come to it. Yeah, so circuitous is definitely a, a, a good word to describe my, my path. Though I, looking at it uh, from, the, from the present, it's not so circuitous, circuitous, but looking at it while it's happening, definitely a lot of meandering going there. So let me, so again, I made comics as a kid. I played sports as a kid. I kept playing tennis as a college student and beyond, and then kept teaching it beyond. And, but in college, I studied mathematics because that's what I did. I made comics on the side, but it's, again, it stays on the side, stays on the side. In Detroit, I run an arts magazine. Again, I'm teaching tennis to pay for everything. And I did end up teaching at the university there. I, I, so I got a master's at that time in D Detroit at Wayne State University in I made up, I, I thought I might do a degree in mathematics, like a doctorate in that, because why not? Yeah. And I took some classes and I stumbled into an interdisciplinary studies program. So I like, oh, I started taking art classes there. So I said, I'll make up my own degree in math and art. So I did that. And I wrote this big thesis on creativity across disciplines, which many of the like pieces of it ended up falling into what I did for my doctorate. And while I was there, I took so many art classes, I, I ended up getting a fine arts degree at the same time. So I have two masters that I did at the same time. So just, I was just there and I was doing stuff. So I was young enough that I could do, you could try a lot of things, right? While you're doing whatever else you're doing. And then that two weeks before a semester started, somebody fell through for their public speaking course. And they, I happened to be at a wedding with somebody and they said, would you teach this? So I, I said, sure. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Like I, I wasn't a particularly skilled public speaker, but the opportunity to watch people grow was really fantastic. And I, I loved it. And it definitely, as somebody who's now done an enormous amount of public speaking all over the world now, it really helped me like be ready to do that, to just drop into something and say, oh, I'm ready. I think I really hit a time where people were hungry for something different. Um, and 
They might not have known anything about comics, but I think they knew that I knew enough about comics and that I was determined enough to find my own way and teach them about it, which is what I ended up doing. But I mostly naively dropped into these things. I said, that sounds interesting. I'll try it. And I was stable enough in my life that I could get away with that. Honestly, teaching tennis as a job that pays pretty well for hourly work and lets you move around a lot, it meant you could do, I could do other, I could use it to fund other things I did. So it worked out. Uh, so I'm going to take you back a little bit to show you some stuff about how I came to thinking about comics, I think. And just to slight recap, as I said, I was into comics as a little kid. Batman is my first word because of having an older brother. And, and then I went and made, and I was, I kept, I made comics all the time, but I made my own series with this locker man in, in seventh, eighth grade. Just an interesting thing about narrative because I, we had locker partners. I don't know what you have in what in England, but we had big lockers and you had to share it with somebody. And and I just made this little sketch of a superhero with I showed like it was just a half a page for my my like the guy I shared a locker with. And I thought this would be kind of fun. And then once I started it, all of a sudden all these ideas exploded out and I had this whole like character and he had to be, so it I did it for the next five years, but it was just this I want to make a sketch to do something in our locker. And then it turned into an ongoing thing for me. And so that idea that, that uh, you know, you just don't know where it's going to start and where it's going to take you. And that certainly took me a long ways. So like I said, I have this gap in comics making for, there's a lot of unfinished projects in there, but mostly, yeah, a lot of unfinished things. But I, in 2004, I, I made this comic about for the 2004 presidential election. And this first one is about security. And you, you can see in it that I'm in it. I'm a character in it telling you stuff. And I was greatly influenced, as you'll see pretty clearly here, by Scott McCloud's really seminal work from 1993, Understanding Comics. So comics people will all know this. Scott, it's an amazing book. It's used a lot in all kinds of courses, from comics, obviously, to web design. And Scott pioneered this thing of himself telling stories and taking us through it. So Scott's avatar is always present in the comic. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to click there. His avatar, oh, it doesn't matter. His avatar is always present and guiding us through. And it's great. And I, I think when I first started thinking about comics as essay, that, that was the model that I turned to. Get stopped here. Anyhow... Shortly after that, I we had I had did the second there was a second art show and I was asked to be in it again and and I wanted to break away from that and I was familiar and quite loved this essay comic by Alan Moore and Melinda Gebby called This Is Information. It was a tribute, it was a 9/11 tribute comic and rather than themselves or some character telling a story, it was this play of words and pictures and symbols. And that really struck a chord with me as a powerful way to use comics. So the, the sort of follow-up to mine, which was two weeks after that first one, I quite literally smashed my avatar, my narrator avatar, right off the bat. And it's this metaphorical thing about voting or a show of hands, right? It's all, everything is a hand. And so that sort of play of it, every panel is, I've got to think of a hand that works with that. And that really became, I have more works like that. I did a thing about how ridiculous the concept of dividing people by red and blue in my country is using all fictional red and blue characters. And I've continued to do things like that. I won't take you through all of that now. In Unflattening, I have a thing about how ridiculous or, or the name comics is or how mistreated the word comics is, not ridiculous. And I started with thinking about Shakespeare's A Rose by Any Other Name Would Smell As Sweet. And I said, comics is I prefer by any other name would smell as sweet. And every single panel has something to do with a rose. So there's this thing that holds it together, but yet it's a disparate, there's no character, there's no real story there. There's the images that hold it together. So for me, the sort of generation of pages of story is this play of trying a different images and words together and seeing how they start to, to lead to something. So I want to jump from that, and let's see if I can jump smoothly here to how I think there about There is comics. so much, because this is such a tease, seeing, <laughs> seeing the, all these images. Where I can. Oh, it's, it's, my, it's, it's so, I mean, I, 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 when, you, when I stood in your comic and you showed me that, that narrative doesn't just go left to top to bottom, 
I, I literally it was like seeing the world differently. It doesn't happen very often but in a yeah. person's life. And, and that was one of the moments for me. And seeing all these slides just reminds me of this. Please don't as assume that uh, your audience knows all the stuff that you know. They're not all going to be illustrators that are familiar no, with it. No, no. Fair enough. I just don't want to drag the guys down into all of this. But let me ask you one more question, because it looks like we're going to, the time's going to time out in five minutes. Don't worry. We'll, if it's all right with you, we'll just start again. If, if they just... Oh, is that okay? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. I want to tell you guys about a little bit about comics themselves, but I'll just, I'll give you a flyover of Unflattening. Unflattening, this was my dissertation, so it's entirely a comic book, uh, the first-ish of its kind. It's a little hard to claim that or not, but when it came out as this book on graphic novel, comic book, Unflattening. Um, it is, in my view, very much an argument for some changes in education and pushing back against sort of education as a system of steps and procedures and a recipe where learning is divided up into boxes of time and space and subject. And to come back to the sort of art and mathematics and tennis thing, it's certainly a little bit of an argument for myself. I think we tend to see the person who studies art and is interested in mathematics or vice versa as freakish. And then you say, oh, and they're also an athlete. And you say, well, that's really weird. But I really think we've been dry drawing these artificial boxes around ourselves and that that restricts who we can be as humans we artificially say i can't be these two things because i'm not supposed to be and i don't buy that at all i think i was very lucky to have a family background that supported me to try things and educate come from a background of educators who tried things so i yeah so some part of this work is definitely an argument for that and i'm gonna jump over it just for the just for the sake of jumping to other things. But I think to, to talk about comics specifically, we're in this time that I can have a comics program about comics when not that long before I couldn't even think of studying comics. But yet, so we see comics as a new medium, but they're really not. This is the origin of comics in the United States as, as a publishing form. And this is the Yellow Kid from the 1890s. You can look back farther, the 1830s, the, the, the Swiss artist Rudolf Topfer, who may have not had that huge an impact, but he was doing things that, you know, that we look back now on and say, well, that's the sort of the grandfather of comics. But really, the sort of making sense of the world of, uh, through picture stories, illuminated manuscripts, the Bayou Tapestry, uh, Mayan codices, uh, Trajan's Column, which is you know, nearly 2,000 years old, Egyptian murals, which are even older, and then things like Lascaux cave paintings. I'm not going to say that's a comic book, but that's people trying to make sense of their world is through images is as old as we've been us. And so we live in a culture where, uh, you know, where words have been the dominant, words and numbers have been the dominant way we count as scholarship. And pictures have been things you put over your couch. They're things that you illustrate with. And I think we've left out part of ourselves. So let me say a little bit about comics and I just for people, some people will be familiar with this. Some people won't and think about the affordances of them. What can I do with comics? And that to me seems definitions are important, but what I can do with comics is even more important. So here, uh, Scott McCloud's understanding comics, this is his definition. And, and, and the beauty of his definition is it opens up, it takes comics away from being like, oh, it's about Batman or Donald Duck and says it's a form of communication. And so he says juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. So that simply means here's my fist. Here's a nice box around my fist. And then in another static image next to it, here's my extended fist. Two static images. Nothing's moving. Nothing's happening, but the reader is animating this. The reader is making the action happen. The reader is bringing it to life. Like you said with narrative earlier, we're taking these sort of disconnected events and we're bringing meaning to them. And we can't help do that, right? And I, I think one of the big keys in this is that time is written in space. The passage of time is written in space. Here I've redrawn a, a Paleolithic lunar calendar uh, from about 30,000 years ago where they're observing the phases of the moon changing from day to day. And like, how do you make sense of that? How do you understand what's going on? You, you observe these events in time and you graphically note them in a spatial sequence. That's the tools you have. You don't have video, you don't have animation, you don't have those things, but you've got this flat static surface and you can make marks and start to understand time. So I think comics are weirdly, weirdly good at explaining, at thinking about time, even though they don't move. 
they don't do anything. There's a lot to say about time. I, I, I might jump all that because we don't want to have every single thing you can I can do. But I'll jump to the other side and maybe... We want to hear about time. I think this, don't feel as though, don't feel as though you're you're indulging yourself because this (laughs) is, all this stuff about narrative is really where we want to dig around. All right. Yeah. Um, So we're talking about uh, comics, this curiously static medium being particularly good at handling time. The passage of time is written in space. So I, I guess I'll move on from there. And so a lot of people have talked about this, right? So this is Will Eisner, who's a master of comics and one of the first people to write about uh, how comics work as part of his own work and his teaching. But I like this, his idea here that time in comics is a bit, it's like relativity in physics. So you move, you might dwell a long time on a panel, you might move quickly. It all depends on on how you want to experience the comic. And you're not, when, when we watch a movie, it's no longer cogs of the film strip. But at some point, you move in, with cogs in the film strip. That's how that's how movies work. So in the uh, media theorist Marshall McLuhan's terminology, uh, uh, movies are a hot medium because you're in the theater and you're really immersed in it. And comics are really cool because you can go at your own speed. You can flip back and forth. You can... So the use of time in comics is quite different. And McLeod explains here, sure, time happens between panels, but it could be a snap or it could be a million years. There's no neat conversion chart between them. And in fact, I love this example with my students, like the time between this guy asking a question and him responding, it might depend on how many panels you put in between the two. It might depend on the length of the panel you put between the two. It might be... but depend on the sort of gap you put between panels. And it might even, it may even be the lack of a border. Like all those things, all those sort of spatial elements matter. And so you can do simple things. Like I, I like this very simple cartoon. Um, this little girl, the repetition of <clears throat> the frames, the repetition of the color of her hair and her outfit allows you to see that, yes, this is the same person taking place over time. Super simple, right? But a pretty, pretty neat way of dealing with time. I'm going to jump over a couple things. So comics handle time really well. And we so we've talked about comics as a sequential art, left to top to bottom. And the heart of how I think about them is the nature of simultaneity, of things happening all at once. Which means you read my page here, left to top to bottom, but you can't help but start to make connections from the lower right back to the upper left and in multiple directions because you're taking it in all at once. You're seeing this whole page all at one time, which means you might, that, that's not only true across the page, but it's true within an, an individual panel. So maybe here you're reading rather associations that stretch web-like across the page. And then maybe you notice there's a spider and a spider web right there. So you start to draw inferences back and forth between image and text and image and text. And so it starts to break the sort of nature, the sort of hierarchical nature of reading. We're, we're reading in a chain, left to right, moving down. It starts to, sh- to rip that up a little bit and allow some other kinds of ways of reading. This has potential for how we think about time. So this is a panel from Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, where the character of Dr. Manhattan is this time-displaced character who's a stand-in for the reader a stand-in for how we read comics. So in the center panel, he says, there's no future, there is no past. Do you see? These two panels here are taking place in the past, but they're coming after these other panels. So we're seeing all of time all at once. And as the reader of comics, and as this particular character who has this higher thing. As McLeod said, that's a little less a part of his theory, thinking about the panels around him, both past and future are real and visible all around us. So you have this experience of, the sequential and the simultaneous all at once. And I think what's what to me is really interesting about it is we move through time in a sequential fashion. At least I assume most of us do, right? We move from from breakfast from getting up to breakfast to classes to job to lunch to whatever. But when we're in a conversation or you're hearing this, you might you think of something like, oh, that makes me think of that, or you're anticipating doing that. So your thoughts are going in this sort of sideways all at once, even as your life is moving sequentially through. And I think comics do this hold those, both of those modes, the sort of sequential linear thing with the all at once simultaneous ways that our thoughts work. 
So I really think that flat surfaces, there's this great power in being static and flat because it allows you to care about both drawing and meta drawing at the same time. I care about both the whole and the individual drawings together. I think I said that backwards. So I'll just give you a couple examples. This is from the French cartoonist Marc-Antoine Matou's um, Museum Vault. And so we might see, I, I could give this to you as nine panels, like a slideshow. But if you give it to you all at once, you might notice in the background that this triangle or pyramid is being made through all the images, this simultaneous image. And this comic is about the Louvre, which has this pyramid out in front. So he's making an image with the whole, even as he's allowing you to read sequence. This is a simple example from Frank King's Gasoline Alley from sometime in the 1930s. And the character bumbles through what is a single simultaneous scene. But it's weirder than just the fact that he's doing stuff and everything else is static. He keeps restarting on the left and he keeps, re and it doesn't make any sense, right? Like he doesn't get to the left and then jump back here. And it doesn't make any sense at all. If you, but, but we're accustomed to reading left or you just take it for granted that we're watching him bumble, even though if you tried to map it out, he'd have to be teleporting back and forth. It doesn't make any sense. So this is from David Mazzuchelli's Asterius Polyp. On the left here, you see sequence, and then the sequence gets all jumbled all at once, and the character's reflecting on that. Simultaneity, the awareness of so much happening at once, is now the most salient aspect of contemporary life. I think comics really handle that. They handle it, they allow you to do both philosophical things, but also just the funny and weird things, like this little guy trying to get his fruit, and he can't figure it out, he can't figure it out, and then he marches up against the hill on this and breaks across the panel. So there's a lot of very strange narrative storytelling things comics can do, which maybe I'll jump over. I'm going to jump to something else here. But I think to come back to how I think about them is, is beyond, we tend to think of comics as images plus text. And hopefully in thinking about McLeod's definition, which doesn't mention words at all, we think about sequence of images. And then thinking about what I said is a sequence of images, but also considerations of the whole, considerations of how the whole works. And so one of my big decisions, besides this sort of metaphorical play of image and text that generated so much of my work, was how the reader experiences the page. So in this example, this is from a chapter on ruts, uh, I wanted to contrast the typical commuter who goes out and back, right? A commuter goes out and back. They go to their job, they come back. They go out with my wife's commute when we were in Manhattan, where she went to different things every day and in a different sequence. And so in a sort of illustrational sense, I could have said, in, here's one hand, here's a typical commuter, and here's my wife. And they're different, right? I could stand there and explain that. But what I wanted to do is, how does the page do it? In the background here, I've got uh, a 16 grid. And in the 16 grid, I've done the typical commuter across Manhattan. So boom, it just does the same thing. Um, meanwhile, I've mapped a, a number of her different routes, and these were all real, onto Manhattan, which sort of drifts across the page like it's a leaf or a feather sort of falling in the way that she's drifted through the city. And so it's fairly simple. You still read in left to right fashion. But there's multiple layers of information coming to you at once. You you can be aware of the background, this beats. It's, a, it's still a flat piece of paper, but we can read all this different level of complexity, the sequential and the simultaneous at once. And this is maybe a better, an even better example. I did a comic for the Boston Globe, and it's about entropy, so how things fall apart, but it's specifically about the, the few things, the moments that go against that flow things like life that sort of emerge from it. So the upper part of the comic, so it reads left to right as like time runs out, omelets don't turn back into eggs, your clothes won't pick themselves up and your coffee grows cold, right? That's the linear flow of time, of entropy. And so it continues that. And over here, it, it, this kicks you over to here. And then you read down the page. And then all of a sudden, you're asked to read right to left, which you're not used to doing. And then you're asked to read bottom to top, which you're definitely not used to doing before you're kicked out around through the page. So my goal with this was how do I make a page that feels like the experience I'm talking about? How do I make something that is that that reflects the sort of linear, but also pushes against it? And to be honest, I make complicated drawings, but the complicated drawings are nothing compared to trying to figure out what I'm going to draw 
how to move you through the page and trying. So I have 50 pages in my notebook where I'm trying to figure out what's the right, what, oops, oops, I clicked on, sorry. So where I try to figure it out before eventually I find, oh, I can do that. And then, and there's still lots to work out. There's plenty of details to work out, but at least now I know what I want the reader, how I want them to dance. And I'm going to say a couple more words about that in a minute. So I think a big thing for me is to think about comics. Uh, we tend to think about them as prose plus illustration. So if I draw good noses and I can write good words, I'm a good comics maker. But I think that rules a lot of people out. But if we instead think about comics as the Canadian cartoonist Seth says, as poetry plus graphic design, then we're really thinking about the space. We're thinking about how to move ideas around in space. And that opens up comics to, to really everyone who can make marks with their body. I invented an act activity about this, which it's documented online. People will be welcome to try it, but it's essentially the short version of it is, I'll try to give you the short version of it, that we tend to compare comics to storyboards. Right? And there's certainly similar things. You care each frame of a storyboard is like each panel in a comic. Except in storyboards, we only care about what goes in the frame. But in comics, and this is Windsor McKay's Little Nemo from around 1908, if we white out the content, you can still get a sense that there's this bed and then it grew. I mean, it really grew and then it collapsed, right? Something happened. In comics, you not only care about what gets drawn in the frame, but you care about the size of the frame, the shape of the, the panel shape of the panel, the, the orientation of the panel, the what it's next to, what it's not next to, and its overall placement on the page. So when you start thinking about that, as my activity makes you do, you discover you can embed a lot of content in the way you move the reader and the way you make the reader feel. And so for me, composition matters. Composition matters. How I structure it matters a lot. And not everybody cares about this as much. Some people do six panel grids and that's just what they do. And that's got its own kind of rhythms to it. But everything you do is giving a kind of rhythm to how you tell your story. So I'm going to jump. So this page, just got a couple more pages here and then I'll wrap this up. This is a page in Unflattening about, I'm referencing James Joyce's Ulysses, uh, a thing about water flow. And he asks this question, did it flow? And then he starts detailing all the place, all the things that went into turning his faucet on, like where the water came from. And I wanted the page to like move the same way that I felt that water flowed or pipes went. And so it goes this way. And then you hit this sort of anchoring piece that leads to here. And the art is all the same through these things. It's all one image. So it anchors you to go that way. And the steam takes you into this. And then the rain falls to take you here. And then we do another one of these. So we snake through the page. So it's, I wanted the page to feel that kind of movement. This page, this is referencing the, the Arabian Nights, Thousand and One Nights, Scheherazade. And I wanted the page, it both does these zooms, these nested images, the way that, that Scheherazade stories are. But it also, it moves the way I feel like her name is, whether an S or a Z, like that's, Scheherazade, it just feels like how her stories go. They meander across the page. This one is about kaleidoscopic vision, and I'm coming at it from multiple ways at the same time. I think, for to me, comics are this profoundly powerful way to represent thinking. And then the flip side of that, and, and I may not say as much about it, but a profoundly powerful way to generate thinking. Working with image and text from the start, People often ask me, what comes first, words or pictures? And I say, yes. And, and I'm not just being sarcastic there. I, it really is when I have those two together, it starts to teach me where I want to go. And I share this. This is the first sketch map I made for Unflattening that's reproduced in the back of the book. And I share it because it's cool to me to see the Easter eggs of what happened and what didn't. But I think it's important to share, too, because one... I think when you see finished art and you're not a drawer, you think it's magic, right? It just came out of your head fully formed. And instead it's this mess. It's this mess and I iterate it and things happen. And, and anybody can make this kind of mess, right? There's no special skill in being able to do this. And the, the other side of that is, as I really like to point out, that it's not a picture of my thinking. This is it. The kind of work I make exists because I start with images and text at the same time. And they take me places and they take me places I don't expect. So if I written something and said, I'm going to add some words to it, uh, it would be very different than what I do. And often the way the images have to work together 
I have to figure out how to make words go that way because they don't, if I was writing a sort of linear sentence, but that doesn't work with the pictures. It doesn't work. It makes this a nightmare for translators. So I want to get, I'm going to just jump to one more thing. Am I good to jump to one more thing? Do, 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 do. Yes. Yes. All right. Sorry. I, got <laughs> I want to show two of my student works. Um, and I think they're really important. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll share one more thing of mine. Um, my, my student works, these, these are both by non-drawers, self-proclaimed non-drawers. And, and I, I think a lot of times I share my work and people buy the argument that like comics is a way of thinking, but they say, not for me, right? Not for me, because I don't draw. And I often start that grids and gestures activity I breezed over. I, I start with that a lot because I, I get them to see how much they actually do understand about drawing, about making sharp lines that mean something's angry or excited and curve lines that mean things are that you don't need to know anything about drawing to know that because you've got a body and you know what sharp edges feel like and to know how much the little decisions you make oh do i make the boxes go like this or did i overlap them like people make those decisions very quickly but i share this one because to come back for the poetry and graphic design if, if you think comics are about illustration and prose if you can draw a good nose then okay you can make comics but but I, I don't think that is the key thing. So this guy not only really couldn't draw noses, didn't even try. You see his characters here. None of them have noses. And yet I think it's one of the smartest applications of what comics can do that I've seen. So this is a comic about his grand grandmother who died of Alzheimer's and he didn't really know her. And he does some really neat things with sort of symbolism. Um, he does a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, her body becomes a question mark here. But my favorite parts, he so there's these three blank panels and he says here i didn't know my grandma i was told about her he doesn't draw anything and he doesn't even draw anything and here the person no longer existed again he doesn't draw anything and then she was nobody so he uses this repetition repetitive grid so he taught us how to read it and then he leaves this part blank not because he couldn't have figured out something to draw but because that was the most powerful thing he could draw is to leave it blank and that to me did his drawing skills improve in the class? Maybe not. But did his thinking skills in space, did his ability to make narrative through the sequential and the simultaneous, the way a panel can be a, a frame and the way it can be a structure? It's great. And so uh, this, this last one I'll share. She was a very shy student, not a drawer. She's, this was a creative writing class or something. I don't, I'm not sure what the students came from. But but she, this is a, the middle part of her final but you'll see here. So she's got these negative words and it says sometimes she could feel the weight of the words on her shoulders. It says, but she is strong and these positive words emanating from the sun. And so she's already mirrored the two pages, right? So she's made some pretty great choices there. And then here, and I, I skimmed over those slides, but she talks about the panel as both a panel, but also as a physical part of the page. And we, we did a lot of that in the class. This is a story about a girl who couldn't fit in a box and they laugh from their boxes that fit as she contorted and twisted, unable to find a place. And finally, so she makes her own box out of words, sounds, and pictures. And soon she learns that there is no need for borders, that boxes restrict her unnecessarily since she can go anywhere she wishes. Yeah, I've read this like a thousand times and I, every time I'm just equally moved by it. She was not a maker. She didn't come out of this as like a strong illustrator. You wouldn't hire her to make fancy illustrations or something at this point. But she understood something about the form that allowed her to say things about herself that surprised her and to say them in ways that are still, when you talk about being inspired, can I make a page? She didn't even use pictures, but it makes me move in directions like that's just such a brilliant choice. And I think one that, that, is definitely accessible to everyone. Maybe I'll, I'll wrap this sort of long bit up here, but I think ultimately, like I, I came to comics, back to comics as a way of making things accessible. Like I wanted to make this, this content, that big idea is accessible. But what I really learned early on is that it changed how I thought. And I think what I learned going forward on and with my students is it's just, it's a different way of thinking is bringing in the visual from the start, it changes the way you start to organize ideas and the way you can layer ideas. And I think now we've had the good fortune to have 
to think about dance, but to have people make dances of my work. And, and that's prompted me to think more about it. But to think about comics making, or at least probably all art making, but as a kind of choreography in that, <clears throat> how do I want you, the reader, to, to feel as you move through this? So it's not just, and, and I, I don't want to say something that feels like it's dem denigrating any other kind of cartoonist, because it's not at all. It's saying, this is for me. How do I get you to move in a way that that feels like the ideas I'm getting in? Because I don't tend to make stories in a more traditional sense. Like I don't have a character that has a character arc. I have an idea arc. Each page has some different challenges about how where do the ideas hit? And then because I'm thinking about that, it often changes what I research. Even though I like come into a page with a certain body of research, then I leave the page having to go work, find more research, which then comes back and then says, oh, I, so it's a very slow moving process, but it's all in iterating this, I find the idea and I find the best way to, or at least uh, a way to embody that idea on the page. And I think about this a lot. I really think about this idea of time being written in space and how things emerge. And I'll just, Sarah, sneak peek at the new work. I said before that, that if you're a non-maker, you tend to think of things as emerging fully formed, like Athena coming out of Zeus's brow, right? But, but that's just not how it is. It's this circuitous, it's this incredibly circuitous journey where you're trying things and for me and, and maybe this is a good place to to wrap it let me see i uh, click here i really i find that my skill at drawing badly has really served me well in that i make sloppy images and then i reinterpret them and i reinterpret them and they teach me things and in this big sort of mess that i make i start to understand things in a different way so I, um i'm not quite sure how to wrap this up except i think so hard about not just what I draw, but about how like this in the green here is which, which way the text reads and it's different in each one. So how text reads versus how certain images read, like how do we think about all those things and give the reader a really a different experience and ourselves as makers. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, if that's all right. And I'll stop my share here. <laughs>